Hi, it's uh, Ricky of Moscow Times here once again. Um, tonight I'm joined by uh, London-based grind death metal band Basement Torture Killings. Um, tonight we've got guitarist focus Paul, also known as Tarquin. We've got the vocalist Millie, also known as Beryl, and we've also got Ewan, also known as the Faceless Killer. Um, it's a shame we don't have Anthony, who's also known as a fa- no, he's also known as uh, Brother Kane, but he's only the bassist anyway, so we're not gonna really gonna miss him that much. Absolutely delighted to see you guys. It was um, it was Badger Fest last month, so I haven't caught up with you since then. So, how was the Badger Fest show for you? Um, how have you been? Yeah, it was really good. Um, I think it was definitely the biggest show of the tour we did. Yeah. Um, and we like got added to it really late. Um, because I think Fetals were already booked on it, so we weren't sure if we were going to play up until about two months before I guess but yeah it was awesome it was really good yeah. um, like the organisation was really professional um, but it was just good to play a big crowd as well um, yeah yeah, it was great really, well, I enjoyed it anyway yeah, as well. yeah. yeah exactly we had a lot of fun doing that uh, yeah. yeah the crowd response was awesome so <laughs> I felt um, I felt sorry for that uh, teddy bear um, I, thought that, I thought it was all cute and cuddly you bringing it on I thought that's really sweet and really lovely uh, not when you looked at it at the end of the show, it wasn't. Um, but it was a really cool show. I really enjoyed your set. So um, good to see you. Good to see you. So um, we're going to talk about all things BTK then. So in May of last year, you released your fourth album, Lessons in Murder. Um, but you also couldn't have uh, picked a worse thing to release an album. So was it a case of you had the songs ready and you just wanted to get it out there? Or was the album already was it uh, planned to be released sooner and it was just delayed and delayed or what was it original so a bit of both so we spent ages recording it just for a variety of reasons um and we'll probably touch on that later but i think if memory serves i sent everything off kind of just before the pandemic hit so we'd done all the artwork all the album was ready we'd sent it off to the label i think that even ordered for the cds to be pressed yeah and then of course the pandemic hit um no one really knew quite what was going to happen. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it wasn't the best time, but it, it's when it came out. And we're just glad it got out there. Well, I am anyway. But yeah, it was yeah, it was an interesting experience and frustrating because we'd had so many shows lined up um, for last year. Um, so we had like Death Feast and just loads of really cool stuff, um, which a lot of it's been pushed back to next year, which is good. But yeah, it was just, it's what it is. That's, that's what I was going to say. Is it just a case of like uh, 2020 copy, 2021 paste, or maybe even to 2022? Are some of them going to be in uh, Europe as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, we'd already planned all the touring that we were going to do for the album. Yeah. So the kind of plan for promoting it was there, but unfortunately COVID happened and it's all kind of been postponed. So everything that we had booked, we're still going to play this coming year. Yeah. Cool, cool. The, the, good, the only good thing about it is you're not, it's not as if you're behind anybody else in the scene. Everybody was in the same boat as yourself. But now that gigs are back, I think what it has done is made people realise how good your local UK and uh, own city scene is. Um, so that's why I thought Badger Fest was immense, because um, it shows that Manchester, for example, has got a great scene. Glasgow is piping up again. Glasgow is a great scene. Mm-hmm. So I think the only good thing about COVID is... People are supporting a local scene anymore. There's no European acts coming or American acts coming anymore. So, yeah, definitely people are hungry. Um, I mean, we were all surprised with the tour. Um, I mean, before I wasn't even sure if I was up for it. Really, it was a bit weird. Like normally, I'm always like planning and really like excited about touring and stuff. But this time, I was like, mm, "Is it going to be good? Isn't it going to be good?" Um, it was amazing. Um, yeah. Even like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights, the crowds were just insane. It, uh, yeah. You know, it wasn't as big as Badger Fest, but, you know, pulling 70, 80, 90 people in Birmingham on a, was it Tuesday? Tuesday night, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was Tuesday, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's just, I just couldn't believe it. Um, and everyone was like really passionate. For me, the promoter saying, we only got 20 people when suffocation came last week on a Saturday. You can't feel good for that, haven't you? <laughs> Well, that's yeah, how true it was, but it is. <laughs> <I'm happy. laughs> you 
guys, uh, it's not as if you're going to sell out the NEC in Birmingham or anything like that. So to pull them out on a Tuesday night in Birmingham, it's got to be pleasing. It's got to be pleasing. Yeah. And every gig was good. Every single gig. Um, Badger Fest was the biggest. Um, yeah. And I was surprised, actually, when we got there. I didn't know quite how big a thing it was or it wasn't. Um because it was a bit more of a mixed bill for us as well. We tend to play some very yeah. scene-based shows, you know. So, but no, that was awesome. London, all of the gigs were amazing. Yeah. Really cool. So looking back on Lessons in Murder then, is there anything, how do you feel about the album? Is there anything that you would change about it? Like the sound or even the songs? Like you, wish you had a longer chorus here or a longer riff here or cut it short and cut it in half. Anything about it? Or are you still... Chuffed. So, up to you. Yeah. yeah I, I like it. I think there's a, there was some processes that we'd maybe <laughs> refine a little bit. <laughs> if <we're>, well, <laughs> but we say that after every album we make, don't we? That's just that's making yeah. music. You do it every time you make an album. You're like, oh, I wish I'd do this. He wishes that I'd played everything twice as fast. I wish he'd, I'd, you know. Practice the song. Just played it. <laughs> Just played the song, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's a, a standard process, isn't it? You, you're, you're your own worst critic with everything that you make in any kind of music, I think. Honestly, all joking aside. I take it, yeah. I think. Sorry, Paul, on you go. I was going to say, we've got quite a unique way of writing. Well, it for, it works for us, but yeah. we always we started off as kind of um, and this is the old lineup where I was in London and our other guitarist and vocalist was in Sweden, so everything would get swapped over the internet, and it's only really when we came together to record that we would ever play together and like do the songs, yeah. for whatever reason, and I guess because we're all spread across across the UK, you and I get together a lot and. Um, jam the songs and get them like relatively tight but the first time i ever sing them is when i'm in the studio and the same for mills yeah. um so yeah. we it, it's almost like a lot of bands or other bands i've been in you like write your songs together you rehearse them you get really really tight and then you just go in and do stuff that's natural whereas for us despite us saying every time we're never going to do it that way again we always do it that way um <laughs> it's almost like you lay the stuff down and then you have to learn it so you can go and play them. But, but I think for me, for the album, it was completely, the way we did it wasn't what we was expecting to do. So the plan originally was to go into the studio, record the drums, which that part of the plan worked. We went into a studio to record just drums. We were going to do the guitars and everything remotely. And then I asked a friend who had his own like um, studio whether we could go in and use it just to do some vocals. So that was going to be the plan. And then he was like, well, I was over there actually visiting. He's like, well, why don't you just come and record your guitars in here and I'll help. And then it became like the whole idea was we would record it and send it off to someone. And we spoke about a couple of different producers and stuff. Um, in the end, he got like this real passion for the project yeah. and wanted to mix it and everything himself. Um, and that's kind of what happened. And it's, it's interesting because we basically got the studio for free. So for the first time ever, it was like having a proper producer in that he was like, well, why don't you try playing that slightly different or put this little bit hidden in the mix and everything else. But I also think we stretched him his capabilities because he was learning on the job. He'd never done anything quite like this before. Um, so it became quite stressful at times. But looking back, I think the beauty of it is I think we've generally got a unique sounding album and in a good way. Yeah. I think it's got its own charm. It's got its own character. Um, and I think it stands up. Um, it's just that little bit different because we could have had an ultra clean, nice production. And to be fair, you and Mills, I think much more in that camp of the type of productions <laughs> they like, whereas <laughs> I just put my foot down. Um, <laughs> but we'll do that next time. Next time we'll do that. We'll do a nice clean production next time. Foot this week? <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't made any of those time comments just yet so. well um, Millie it's easy for like uh, for the likes of Paul to pick up the guitar and uh, like in the last 18 months and stuff like that it was easy for them to pick up the guitar and get riffs and things like that organised how did you keep your vocals in check in, that, in those times um, probably the same that I always do um, like 
I also sing as well as do you know the brutal vocals that I do so usually like my practice is just a bit of singing to be honest yeah. like yeah it's just kind of keeping it going you know because it's also about all that breath control etc that goes with it so you know it's kind of one and the same so I, w- I didn't have much of an opportunity to do much of the scream and stuff just because the neighbours I don't think would be too impressed but I, I'm pretty confident that what I have stays there it just you know what we practice when we do finally get around to practicing all together it just takes a bit of refinement at that time yeah I was actually wondering what your neighbours thought of you when you were like practicing you were like singing in the shower or uh, singing in the car and stuff like that you know so uh, it's good to see that um, you don't piss off your neighbours too much (laughs) I do (laughs) (laughs) so (laughs) for I don't know why, but you know when you sometimes you just sat on your phone, you end up like YouTube surfing and watching different videos. I ended up watching um, a video on how to do like um, Gutterlax type vocals. And I thought, right, I'm going to learn how to do that. So for about three months, that's all I was doing. But I haven't learned how to do it. And we're going on tour with them soon. And Martin might see this. So I'm definitely not going to try it now. Um, But yeah, I think that pissed the neighbours off. And if it didn't piss the neighbours off, Rebecca definitely hated it. She was like, you know, you could people can hear you doing it. I was like doing it in the streets, everything. (laughs) Do you always have um, lots of for sale signs around your house? People just... (laughs) They demolish the flats next door, (laughs) finally. It's Uh, not lying. (laughs) They actually do as well. (laughs) Good stuff, good stuff. (laughs) <laughs> With the album being um, over a, a year old now, um, I imagine you guys have already been busy writing new material, or have you been concentrating more on promoting the latest album now that you can? So, I think, so at the beginning of the pandemic, we were going to do the, uh, a lockdown EP, was the idea. Um, and in about two weeks, I wrote seven or eight songs. Um, some of them I shared with the others, some of them I didn't. And then I, can't, I don't know why you recorded drums for a couple of tracks, I, didn't you? Yeah, on this, I've got even GoPro footage of about three or four. Songs. Yeah. So, no but basically, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So basically, I did that, and then I I, I worked all through the pandemic, um, and my work just went nuts. I, I was working harder during the pandemic um, than ever before. So, as a result of that, it kind of just got it's in my hard drive on the computer. Um, but I'm kind of, part of me is quite glad as well, because I think the problem when you, all our stuff sounds the same anyway, but especially when you like, when you put everything, you do that in such a short time, I found the ideas get regurgitated. So I think I've listened to a couple of tracks and I'm like, most of it's pretty good. Some of it's not. So we've got a good grounding um, for when we decide to write again. But I think for now it's, it's, it's about the, um, about promoting the album. Um, we've got to do a recording. We're going on a. We're really good friends with a band from Portugal called Holocausto Cannibal. Don't know if you know them. Um, there's a tribute CD. Hopefully, I'm not supposed to keep that quiet. But anyway, there's going to be a tribute CD to them, um, and so we're going to do a. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to do a track for that. So that we've got to record in the next few weeks. Um, but other than that, I think it's back concentrating the album. The stuff that's there. We can pull out whatever. Cool. Thank you. Cool, Millie. Cool, is uh, Paul the type of guy that will send you a riff at four o'clock in the morning saying this is the best riff I've ever recorded? It gets a bit of flack for that sometimes because sometimes you do that. <laughs> like, no, it just sounds like shit carcass, doesn't it? And then... <laughs> <laughs> but no, in all, in all fairness, no, he's, the, he's a pretty motivated dude in that sense. Um, yeah, that, that, that kind of songwriting process does, you know, opens up a you know places you didn't know exist sometimes don't they <laughs> in in good and bad ways when we're giving each other stick or it's like oh yeah that's actually something good let's keep that bit kind of thing sometimes you come back the next practice a week later and it's like yeah get rid of that that's 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 no good <laughs> it's just luck of the draw is really on that one isn't it i think sometimes cool cool but over again we're going to talk about the last 18 months look more at the business side of the band, like keeping the band name uh, BTK out there for everybody to hear, like doing merch, doing marketing, like you guys maybe doing roles that you've never done before, but you now have to, to keep yourselves alive and keep your name out there. I think 
certain amount. Um, there was a lot. I mean, we were quite lucky in one way because despite the album coming out at a really shit time, there yeah. were plans in place. So we had like our lyric video that was already going to be made. Um, I had to go and make in a lyric video, um, which was all right. It's not great, but it was okay. Um, we've got the cartoon we did. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of that that went on. And yeah, just general um, posting stuff. Um, but it, it, it's hard. It was really hard. Yeah. You know? um, and I think it, you know, we were the... F- I think we were probably one of the first tours um, post pandemic that went through like the UK of our sort of genre. Yeah. Um, but up until that, it was, it was, it was slow. It was getting a little bit slow. You could tell it cause you, your merch sales drop off a little bit and, and everything else. When the album came out, it was good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're back now. Cool. Cool. Did you get a sense of like, um, you kind of welcome to break as well. You're getting a wee bit burnt out when you're getting a wee bit, I just want to put BTK to the side for a wee bit and just have a wee bit of life. Or um... I'm wanting to. <laughs> <laughs> I think we did. We hit a lot of gigs the the two years before COVID, didn't we? We were, yeah, you know, playing single Europe shows every other weekend for a long time. And you know, as much as I, I love it, don't get me wrong, I, I'd never speak a bad word about it. It's great fun, but it, you know. Yeah, when yeah. you're getting up at Monday morning to go to work, it, it takes its toll after a while, doesn't it? But, yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't it, do that for the world. <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it does become quite tiring, especially when you're yeah popping over to Europe just to play this one show, coming back, going to work, and then in a few weeks doing the exact same thing all over again. Like, for me, I was um, studying to be a mental health nurse at the same time as doing all of that. And so when the pandemic hit, I was just finalizing the end of that so in a way it was quite nice to have that bit of a break to stop and like actually have a bit of a rest but also I don't know being busy is just really nice as well so not being able to have that outlet that we have you know musically creatively was yeah quite difficult I think it's absolutely fantastic and ironic that you're uh, training to be a mental health nurse uh, with the role that you play in the band. I'm just actually wondering if your work know what it is that you actually do and whether you should be a case study yourself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I, I actually kept it quiet for a, a long time, especially because um, I actually work in the forensic setting. So um it's yeah it's people that have committed crimes whilst they've been a well that kind of thing um we step people down from Broadmoor that kind of stuff <laughs> so that's where you get your inspiration for your lyrics I mean yeah it certainly helps definitely <laughs> um but uh, <laughs> recently they've all discovered what I do um, so I can't keep it secret anymore <laughs> well don't worry about it this is only going to be splattered all over the internet so it's going to be fine <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm convinced Sam um, did you see that guy the other week that's just been had like killed a couple of people but had also been um was working in a morgue for a long time it's recently this week um anyway he, he, he was some killer and they've worked fat they've traced him through DNA from years and then they've when they raided his house they realized he'd been um doing horrific stuff to bodies in the morgue where he was working um, and I'm fairly convinced there's going to be something like that come out about Millie at some point, <laughs> you know, with her like. <laughs> yeah, to hear first, ladies and gentlemen. Well, there we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to get a punch for that. <laughs> yeah. Watch out. <laughs> it won't be uh, the teddy bears, Amazon legs that will be getting cut off. It will be yours. Um, yeah. <laughs> So with the record, we kind of touched on it a wee bit earlier, uh, the recording of Lessons and Murder then, will there be anything that you'll do differently with your next release? Like, um, what was it you send, what was it you would say that you learned most about the recording? I think... About 2.45 BPM. <laughs> in a, in a rush. <laughs> I would love, like, absolutely, and I joked about it earlier, I'd love to be in a position where actually we've learned the songs as a band and then go into a studio. I don't think yeah. we've got the luxury of going into a studio for two, three, four weeks like other bands do, just because we have to make a choice. Do we play shows or 
do, do we do we record for a long period you know there's we've got family lives and everything else but if we could get to a point where we could have some of that i think that would be pretty cool um and our, our recording projects always take us ages like i think we started was it it was just after christmas wasn't it when we did the drums like 2019 yeah january yeah. february wasn't it january february and um, i think it would have been about November or December that we had the finished product and sent it off to the label, um, which is, you know, in the one hand, it's good because it gives you time to tinker, but tinkering can have its own problems as well. You can over listen. I, I think I think that's one of the things that we struggled with the most, wasn't it? Um, we I think we listened to it so much and started asking for so much to be changed because we I think we had the luxury of being able to do that and it, it in the end it became a bit more of a curse than a blessing actually because we became overly critical and you know you get that studio year when you you've listened to something over and over again and we just kept feeling like oh we're not quite happy with it but we are and I think that <laughs> that, whole <laughs> process, <laughs> that whole process of we even rejected a whole master didn't we um that we didn't like and we were just like no it's not right and Let's do that, that was, like, Yeah. Yeah, there was some of that. I can't remember if it was a whole master or whether it was just... Was it an example track that we... Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. We, so, so, we, we, yeah, and, we did uh, a It just wasn't right. Cover. You know, yeah. It's got to be right, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That did happen. But we got there at the end. It's just much toil and strife. That's it. So so, we talked about how the songs are constructed then. But how do you... Uh, what about when it comes to negotiating what stays in and what stays out of a song? Do you have like a vote or uh, how does it work? It's a bit like um, the Chinese electoral system. There's an illusion of um, <laughs> democracy, but uh, ultimately we kick the ideas around and I say what stays. Um, no, that, that is... <laughs> I, I don't. He'd love to fix it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I think we we do like so we send the ideas backwards and forwards. There's like critiquing there, but most of it it's uh, me and you and spend so long jamming together because we live quite close to each other yeah. um, and working on the songs. I think we cut bits in the songs um, and come I up with different the ideas. Turn into bits of song as well, though, don't they? It's like, oh, yeah, they do. Oh, we only did it three times that time. Oh, well, that was quite good. Let's keep it that way. You know, like learning on the job kind of thing is sometimes good, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think... As long as it goes blast, we... thrash, blast, thrash, you know, blast, thrash. <laughs> that also helps. Really yeah. Like, yeah. Regimented. We kind of... We, we come up with... Um, some really bizarre working titles for songs um so ev everyone ewan's got like um ev everyone says he's a bit horsey this equine um so one of the songs erotophonophilia um was called operation kill horse boy um what were some of the other ones there was a few really uh, sad after nine months of learning the songs when you have to come to actually having <laughs> in front of you at a gig and <laughs> remembering the real names of the songs opposed to the working titles and actually you know you've got about three seconds between takes while there's an intro playing to actually think oh it's that one that, 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 that. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's quite a high pressure moment there in the first few gigs so it must be quite great yeah. for you then uh, when you're playing a live gig then you and because you've got the, the the song sheet and you're like i don't know what's that song i don't know that song uh, the first gig we played uh where we played most of the new album didn't we i wrote the working titles on the printed <laughs> in this because I was not that I didn't know the songs I knew the songs but I just <laughs> in that high pressure moment on stage you don't want to have any question in your mind so I wrote <laughs> all of them yeah anyway that's that's one of those that's never been talked about in public before. <laughs> no it hasn't has it <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh well there it is well that's actually what I was one sorry better off uh, what were you going to say Oh, sorry, I thought I interrupted you there, you there Millie. But I just wondered, like, um, if there was blood in the walls and fisticuffs in the studios, or who's the moody one? Who's the one that goes on, goes out, goes in a huff all the time? Billy. <laughs> we, we, we all get on pretty well, to be fair. Yeah. Um, we have our moments. 
<laughs> Millie's like, yeah. Um, <laughs> we give each other a lot of stick. Um, yeah. And on tour, yeah. things can get fractious. Like, we did, um, about the year before the pandemic, we came up with this great idea of doing four dates um, with fetal juice again um, across Europe. Yeah. And basically, we did um, Paris on the Thursday. We drove to, was it Palencia in Spain? So we played that on the Friday uh, at Brutal yeah. Logos. Yeah. Then we drove to Porto. Then we drove back Victoria. to Vitoria in Spain, like the Basque country, um, and then drove home. And so I think it was 2,400 miles or something in five days. Um, and what made it worse was we played, whenever you play shows in Portugal, um, the time that we normally go home after gigs are finished in the UK is when they open the venue. So I think we played three in the morning or two in the morning. Um, we got back to the hostel um, a bit later. Millie was doing her best to get us thrown out and not allowed into the hostel <laughs> with members of <laughs> Fetal Juice. <laughs> I think we'd woke the guy up. And then so in the end, we, we fell asleep. And then when we worked out, what we didn't realise is Portugal's on GMT. Right. Yeah. Whereas the, you lose the hour. So basically, we had to leave. We worked, thought we had to leave at like nine in the morning, but we ended up realising we had to leave at eight or we thought we'd leave at eight and it was a seven. So we got like three hours sleep and then straight on to Victoria. So on that tour, there was some definite grumps. Um, and our driver ran someone over as well, but it was the guy's <laughs> fault because he shouldn't have got behind the van. No one got hurt. No one got hurt. Much. Just, just a foot. Really him over. <laughs> 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 Well, it is lyrics for the next album, but never mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, with it being 18 months, I'm going to talk about that again. Um, was it was it not logistically possible? Like, did you ever think of doing like a virtual gig or doing a recording in the rehearsal studio or something like that and just putting it out online? So, again, keeping the name of BTK out there, or was it just not logistically possible? So... We did, <laughs> but <laughs> us being us, no, it only no. got, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, because us being us, it only basically got released about a week ago. Um, there was a thing called <laughs> Sick Dog Fest. Yes. You saw it, you saw yeah. it. So we toy, we did toy with it, didn't we? But it was hard logistically. Um, yeah. I think we were um, off Yeah, we so. It would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? But yeah. travelling in the middle of a pandemic was a bit, no, no, wasn't it? And yeah, and I think we were offered to do one, and I'm, I'm not going to say where, but we were offered to do one, and originally we said yes, let's do it. And then I, I think I remember one of our late night WhatsApp chats, and if we did it, we wanted it to do it where it looked good. Yeah, and I don't, I think we all agreed it wouldn't look good. It would just look like us playing in a pub, and so we decided not to do it. Um, then a few weeks later, I got an email from Mexico. Do you want to do Sick Dog Fest? Um, and I was like, Yeah, I do want to do that actually, because that was pretty cool. That I watched that was one of my highlights of the pandemic that weekend when they did um, Sick Dog Fest. I, I watched loads of it. So then, but the good thing about that is we knew we could make it look how we wanted to make it look. So we spent like a whole day, well, two days, wasn't it? Like we did up all the studio. Um, we got Sam Turbot to mix and master it properly. Um, we got someone in to play the part of the victim. And we knew that we could do it in a way that would be interesting to watch because, you know, the greatest respects, there's, I, I didn't see it, but Bayamoff did their huge um, yes. show. But they've got lots of money and they can make it look really fucking cool. And, you know, um, some other bands did it. Like I watched one of the Metallica ones um, where they did like an acoustic thing. Don't get me started. But I, I watched that. But, I, you know, they had a video wall that could zoom into people and chat to them and all this sort of bells and whistles. We couldn't do that. And I just, I just, I think we all felt, didn't we? It would just look shit just being in a pub. Yeah. So that's why we, we left it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we kind of like hold hold 
you know what we do on stage to like a fairly high standard like theatrically and it'd be quite difficult to replicate that yeah in a kind of just general streaming gig I think so when we were offered that opportunity from Mexico being able to have that level of creative control over it meant that we could do a lot more of it that we you know how we desired it to look. Well, I've said, no, no, I've okay. the... no I quite right I mean I, I did see a couple and I was like mm. I think the best one that I saw obviously would be Hamoth but uh, Ingested I thought theirs was superb but that would have been I don't know about £7,000 to do or something like that professionally uh, yeah. well, loads of bands don't have that kind of money so um, no, but you're not the only ones that have said that we thought about it and we really did consider it but I just wouldn't I mean imagine for the vocalists you, you come to the end of the song and you're just waiting for the audience response and there's nobody there uh, yeah so that would have been a weird feeling we did have that a was good really... for our victim because it was the first gig he'd watched in almost two years. And he was <laughs> absolutely cool. He was loving it, you know, covered in blood, shackled up to a chair with a GoPro stuck to his head. But he was, he was well chuffed. <laughs> Actually, yeah, yeah, it was... did a very good job. Like, he, did. he did do a good <laughs> job. <laughs> a particular favourite bit of that was um, we put like this big clamp on his leg. Right, just you know, to look like torture, but it wasn't on tight because you know he's the bloke giving up his time, and it was all fine till Millie stood on the clamp and it just like, it went straight into his leg. He took it in good humour, um, but yeah, it, it, even that though was really weird because so we set it up, um, we played the first song, and it's the first time any of us had been in costume for like a year and a half. There was loads of lights there, and it was just dead. Like, because there was no crowd or anything. And first gig. Like, well. And first gig, and really yeah. inaccurate. Um, so I'm glad we did it that way, because you had a lot of control. So, that, so the way we filmed that set is everything is 100% live. So it was all taken live and filmed, but we didn't do it song, 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 song. We played a song, and then we, like, would redo the cameras and all that stuff, and then play the next song and the next song and the next song. Um, and I think that was a good way to do it because you have that creative control. You know, if um, one of the cameras slips, apart from the drum cam, we won't mention that, will we, Ewan? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we could have just that. So the, so the drum cam is, um, Ewan works in the creative industries. Like, what does he do? Just put lights up and that. Creative stuff, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he does, like, lighting and all that sort of jazz. Yeah, and um, so... <laughs> He got really into it, didn't you? It's like I was calling him you and Spielberg. So it's like getting all these clamps and all the cameras <laughs> everywhere. And then we basically had a GoPro um, by his drum kit, and it had the best angle you could possibly. He spent ages getting there, and it was all clamped on, and it was awesome. And every time we checked it, it looked awesome. The only problem was it attached it to the side of our bassist's amp. Hey. So as soon as Ant um, played it just went and we couldn't use any of the footage which was like but every time we checked it looked perfect it's like yeah it's not slipped okay cool let's go and so yeah there was a schoolboy error there but it's a no, shame no actually because well no one cares about drums does it it's just like boot black boot black and it blasts fresh so no that was that was it was fun. like i i think that came out really well yeah um very very quickly though like paul uh, you have to be honest here who made the most mistakes Oh me, always. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was so strange. Yeah. I um came back from that and I thought I'd played like utter dog turd. I was like really miserable, um, and like really bad. And I like, was talking to on in the group chat, and I was talking to Sam, who like mixed it and everything for us. And he's like, I don't think it was that bad. I was like, it was really shit. And I was like really grumpy. And then I heard like. That it came like a week and I was like oh it was fine I don't know why I was being such a big <laughs> like, yeah I, I, I don't know why but I just and maybe it was the vibe isn't it like because there's no crowd or anything and I found it really I don't know about you guys but I found it really quite stressful because in a live environment you play it and if it goes wrong it goes wrong but you, you can't you cannot do anything wrong you cannot do anything about that yeah. With this, if it went wrong, we could say, actually, we want to do it again. 
because you're filming it and you're recording it. And that built in a pressure that I wasn't expecting because it was almost like trying to record an album and get like really good parts and takes. But all four of you have got to do it at the same time. Yeah. And there was times where I was really happy and you and wasn't. Fact, and, we, and, and we, we just talked more because of camera rubbish. But that also. <laughs> but that, I just think. Like, you know, yeah, but there was a couple. There was a couple we did that. There and there was. And then when we listened back, they sounded great. Yeah. But the pressure, I, I personally, I found that one of the hardest things we've ever done. I've like really, really struggled with it, and I was quite surprised by that. Cool. Yeah, so thanks very much for that, guys. Um, with Paul and Millie being the vocalists of the band, then do, do you guys do the lyrics yourselves, or do you welcome contributions from all the band when it comes to lyrics? Yeah, I think well before. Before it was mostly Paul. Um, on this album, I got a bit more. I got a bit more to write, which was good. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've invited those guys to write anything yet. <laughs> I'm not inviting you to write any drums though, so it's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can if you want. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, no, mate. You, you're doing a fine job. So just keep doing what you're doing, isn't it? <laughs> Is that something that you want to do, Millie, more and more? Is like do lyrics because I imagine, like, when you're writing the lyrics, you're visually seeing you singing them. So I imagine it'll be quite tricky sometimes if Paul's written the lyrics. How does he want you to sing it? Yeah, I think we come across this uh, problem quite a bit actually, um, and uh, we we kind of send each other like brief vocal demos, which are kind of just spoken word bits on how. <laughs> How we want it to sound rhythmically, um, <laughs> which <laughs> come across awful at best, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> it's quite difficult to, to decipher how it's going to sound, but, um, you know, we, we just do our best with that. Do you know something? On the live front, there's nothing more pleasing for me, and I imagine a lot more uh, punters, is dual vocals. Um, I think it just adds so much diversity to a song when you see two different vocal styles. I mean, uh, Nile, for example, saw him a few years ago um, and they, they had the three of them and I was just, ah. it's just absolutely brilliant seeing more than one vocalist. So I'm just so pleased uh, with the dual vocals. So keep it that way. Yeah, we will. We will. It's I think right. the writing I mean, of... <laughs> I mean, Paul hasn't been completely demoted yet, so... <laughs> on that so it's, she's driving because on the tour um when we were like sound checking everyone like the sound man would be like can i have the main vocals and then they'd be like can i have the backing vocals please and the first two or three nights she didn't even notice but by the seventh or an eighth night um yeah <laughs> so it's like it would draw vocalists so yeah but the writing for the lyrics on this one was quite interesting different to how we've done it before because we came up with this concept of doing the audio guide um which happened on a tour with fetal juice ironically um uh, one of them turned around and said why don't you do a dummies guide for serial killing and we were like yeah that's really funny and then about three weeks later we were planning it but obviously we couldn't i've actually got a mocked up cover that looks like one of the serial killing guides for dummies in the yellow and everything i want to do it as a t-shirt at some point but that's how the concept came up but then we kind of um just to everyone i was like write any titles down that you could think that would be lessons and i remember being um i was uh, my girlfriend's parents and they were driving they live in norfolk and they're driving me to down the market because we have to go shopping on a saturday morning and i'm sat in the back of the car like thinking right what would you need to learn if you're a serial killer and um i was like yep definitely how to hide bodies we'll do that and we were just coming up with song titles but as lessons and then it was kind of a case of Mills you choose whichever ones you want to write I'll choose the ones I want to write um and it was quite cool I I, it, I I found it quite challenging writing them because it wasn't normally their stories aren't they whereas this time you had to put it or we tried to put it in the context of a lesson um which I found quite interesting I don't know about you Mills whether that was harder or easier or yeah, I do. Did, I did think it was quite difficult to to write in that way. Like, it's not in a way that I've ever tried writing before. Like, so to have a the concept 
the idea of what a song's going to be before you write it. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite alien, really. But it, I think it worked out quite well because it, it gave us, I suppose, a lot of direction. And so you just have to kind of like work around that and try and find ideas that fit that. Watching lots of serial killer documentaries always helps, you know. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's been a good run at uh, Amazon for the last six months and stuff like that. Been really interesting. I like documentaries. So, uh, but yeah, but I'd imagine, Millie, like when you get Paul's lyrics, um, you just change them anyway and you just sing them and he won't be <laughs> singing anyway. So, yeah, I just I ignore, I ignore most of what he tells me to do. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool, cool. Um, but yeah, now following you guys a wee bit on social media and things seem to be fairly settled now in the band members front. Um, so let me uh, just pause that for a wee second. Okay, so um, am I correct in saying that I've been signed to the Growing Bizarre Leprous Productions? So how did that come about? How's the relationship been so far? And what would you hope that BLP do uh, with BTK? There's a lot of initials in that question. <laughs> There is a lot of initials. <laughs> was um, work there. <laughs> so I, it's a bit weird actually, because I had a plan that well, that's who we were going to sign to. So we were talking about it before. Um, all our other albums were done on Grind Scene. Well, the first one we did in uh, Arcane Promotions, then we did Grind Scene, and they worked really good um, for the UK, but we couldn't get any exposure in Europe. So we want, I wanted to go to BLP because I had some of my favourite bands. So that 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 was my 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 mission. Um, we then went to um, Slovakia. We played what what the, not what was the festival? Flesh Feast. Flesh party. Flesh party. Flesh party. Flesh party. Yeah. yeah. We played Flesh Party. What and yeah, at the fest. And I'll well, they're gonna have to tell you that story. Now. <laughs> but um, so we played because it comes into this. It comes yeah, into this. Right. So we 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 basically played our set, and um, later on that night, I thought, right, I'm gonna go to the BLP tent because it was next to the stage. I'm gonna go chat to the guys, and when I turned up, um, the guys there were like, "Oh, your set was really cool." Uh, blah 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 blah. And I was like, "Well, you know, I." quite interested in talking to you about signing you know like we want to do something with you so he was like come around into the tent so we sat and we were like talking about it and basically the the, the idea of doing the album was done there and then but then they were like oh but where's your singer we want to get a photo um with your singer so we'll, we'll time out there and let them tell you where millie and ewan was <laughs> Well, it was a festival, I'd like to point out, you know, so, and that place is awesome. It's like a mini obscene extreme kind of vibe, but with 500 people in the middle of the forest with a couple of merch tents and one stage. It is it's a sick little underground place, beautiful part of the world. And, uh, you know, massive river next door. There's a lot of people just camping out just everywhere, wherever you want, find your tent full, whatever in it. It was, it was a very chill vibe. Uh, so everyone's swimming in the river. We've been in the river earlier in the day when it was like beautifully hot and nice and feeling a bit drunk. Me and some certain Belgian friends from another band decided we'd go for a little swim in the river. And uh, some, I've never seen this, but a river that's 2,000 miles away from the sea seemed to have some kind of tide. And we'd left our belongings next to the river. And we're in the river and all of a sudden all of our clothes phones, wallets, everything uh, underwater. And we're like, one of, was it Jermaine? Was like, guys, guys, you need to come and look now. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. So Paulie finds us in this situation when he's trying to be all serious and like, you know, do bandy things. And we're literally with no possessions that are not sodden wet. Soft and wet clothes. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, we so, having a great time up until then. <laughs> <laughs> our bassist at the time was having a bit of a meltdown because he was worried we were going to miss our bus as well. So anyway, I got Millie and um, <laughs> I took her to the tent. She was like drunk and really annoyed because her phone was ruined and everything. And then, um, yeah, we got in and they were like, oh, can we have a photo? And she's like, this 
there's a picture of this photo and literally she was almost like crying on me until I got to the tent and then it was like rock star pose and everyone's like oh it's wicked wicked and then she was just like meltdown again <laughs> but so that was that and then um later that night they put us up in the Slovakian fisherman's hut didn't they um which was kind of a, a, a strange environment. It's like, I think uh, it was like a fishing club and they have like digs that like, uh, it's almost like a hostel, but not. And we got there and um, it was a bit hostile, to, to be honest. But they looked it. after, yeah, yeah, we could. But they looked after us really well. Yeah, they were lovely. They were lovely. And then the next morning, I was like, how cool is it? We got signed to BLP. And she's like, no, you didn't. No, we didn't. You're just talking shit. And I was like, do you not remember? And then, yeah, we did. So that was that. <laughs> and the deal was secured at Obscene Extreme. I didn't believe it until Obscene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's what clinched the deal. Um, I think so. Yeah, yeah, that pose. I think that's what clinched the deal. Um, but that, that's, <laughs> like, um, because I've often wondered, like, you've got a record label, but does that not bring its own time pressures and you need to do this and you need to do that and all the rest of it? Did you ever think of releasing it independently where you didn't have that? Um, or did you always, after grind scene, did you just want immediately to be with another label? So we could have done it with grind scene again. Um, but I think BLP are a really underground label. It's not like being on, you know, even like some of the UK labels um, that would come with a lot more demands. They're very cool. Um, they had, I spoke to Sir Roman that owns um, that own, owns the label. When we discussed how it was going to work, he was like, look, you're going to get this many CDs. Um, you're, you can do whatever you want with them. If you want to release your music digitally, you can do it yourself. You do whatever makes you happy if you want any extra cds you know we can arrange that um i'll do the stuff for blp and we'll do what you do what you need to do um and it is as loose as that and if we want to do another album we'll speak to them and maybe they'll say yes maybe they'll say no and, and we'll decide it, it's not th th there wasn't any pressure whatsoever i think we put or me i put us under more pressure because i was worried we'd lose the opportunity because it took so long no like it for, for us it was it was perfect um uh, you know they, they've done what they everything they said they do they've done and you know it's got us out in territories we weren't there before so it's good yeah yeah um, moving on to the visual side of things then like uh, you released a couple of lyric videos during the times uh, where people couldn't meet but do you see another video from lessons and murder to conclude the visual side of the albums now that you can Things, that's right? definitely the plan. <laughs> in six months' time, we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we will do another video for sure. Um, I think we've just got to pick the song. Um, but I don't know if you've seen our original video, the Severed Head Fellatio one with our own vocalist. Yeah. That was quite an intense, high level, high bar video. And I think we all want to do that again. Um, I know you do, Mills, a lot. Oh, I'm very so, keen. Yeah. Is it something that's uh, got the creative ideas? Is it like, well, you might come up with a song or something like that and the riffs and things like that, but somebody else is, hey, this is what we're going to do with the video? So yeah. I think, it, it, yeah, it, it will be like that. We'll just chat. Everything we do normally in this band starts as a joke. It's just, uh, wouldn't it be funny to do this? And then it happens. Um, and I think it will be the same with this. Um that is bizarre everything but like even starting that's how the band happened anyway that's another story um but yeah i think we just need to choose the song that we all agree on um and take, there's some stuff in the live pardon that'll take a long time now then won't it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not. it's how it starts right now isn't it surely really? yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think i've got i've got a couple that i would like to do but we'll have to chat. But we, we will do one. We've got to do one. Because um, it's so important, all the visuals these days. So important. Yeah, definitely. Definitely agree. Um, but you talked about it a couple of times. You've just finished a tour with Fetal just now. I don't know whether I'm more shocked that you guys are alive after many nights of drunken debauchery uh, with Fetal Juice, <laughs> or whether Fetal Juice are still alive as you haven't killed them yet. Um, how was the tour and playing again with your good mates Fetal Juice? It was lovely to be back on the road. 
first things first, you know, after a couple of years. They were the last band that we did more than, what, a couple of dates with. So to just hop back in a van two years later with them again was, it was like, you know, open the door on the COVID time and then <laughs> close it again and, you know, carry on where you left off. It was great. I love those guys, man. Great yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're so all easy to tour with, honestly. The easiest guys. And we, we couldn't have hoped for better touring buddies for our first load back, to be honest. Mm. You know what, and we're also very surprised that we survived. <laughs> yeah. I, I interviewed them on the Friday and then on the, the following day I, I saw them uh, supporting Score the Tura. And, you know, they just approached you and they're so nice guys, you know. They, ever, like the same, way you think, the same way you guys, the lyrics that you have and the things that you sing about and all the rest of it and the imagery and stuff, you couldn't speak to nicer guys, you know. Um, so uh, you see all their videos and stuff like that on Facebook as well. They must have, like, so many drunken memories. I, I feel sorry for your livers, to be honest with you. <laughs> it was hurting on, afterwards. Coming home was horrible. <laughs> the pints were the bad. Like, there's more, more damage, really. <laughs> oh, they have um, things called belly busters in... Uh, was it belly busters? Yeah, that's basically um, these kebabs oh, they have near so. Desi's house in... Oh, like, yeah. literally, oh, it's yeah. like a baby you hold. It's ridiculous. No. So, yeah, it was, no. good. it was good. Good stuff, good stuff. So, you've, have you got a couple more gigs before the end of the year? Um, um, what's we got? We after One next. more. Bit of London. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, Beyond the Grave first. That should be good. Yep. And then we were supposed to be going to Portugal in January. But that's been COVIDed to 2023. Um. And then what else? I'm trying to think what I can say we are doing and what I, hasn't been announced yet. Oh, the Gut Lacks tour in March. We can do that. Uh, yeah, that that's that's known. And we've got um, Death Feast and a couple other festivals. Is the Gut Lacks tour, tour in, or is it UK as well? UK. It's just uh, UK. Well, England, basically. Wow. Um that's the end of the interview. Thank you. No, no, no. I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it like that. I meant that again. We're not going to Scotland. Is is what I meant. Is they they can only come. Scottish date is probably. I think that we do need to. I love yeah, Scotland. I love like, <laughs> but that was one of our ideas, wasn't it, on the field tour that we would do? Um, maybe like Aberdeen and Dundee, um, or Elgin or something. Just go proper high, high up. That would be cool. Aberdeen was cool last time we played that. Yeah, yeah, That's we've done everything twice, I think. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, um, I mean, you've got Dundee, uh, you've got Aberdeen, but even places like Elgin, as you say. Um, I mean, Aberdeen, for example, they're just scree- screaming out for gigs. Um, so I think when you play Aberdeen, you'll always get a good crowd because they're just screaming, screaming for gigs. Yeah. This is like Elgin as well. Okay, it's definitely a smaller venue, but more in your face. Um, so yeah, I mean, Napalm Death did a whole tour like that donkeys years ago when they went back to their roots and they were playing places like Elgin. So there's definitely a market for it. Definitely a market for it. Just- yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. yeah, that'd be awesome, honestly. Like, Scotland's always great. Well, I mean, well, you guys obviously know your promoters and stuff like that, but um, a guy, you, you know Hamilton Hunter and stuff. I don't know if you know Craig Law of Goddamn Promotions as well. Um, he's in the band uh, Dominicide. Um, they just mm-hmm. released an EP a couple of months ago. Okay. Really, really cool. But yeah, there's definitely a good um, Glasgow scene. So if you're looking to come up, then give us a shout. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we're coming towards the end of the interview then. Um, before I ask, I could probably start another 40-minute recording. But what's next for BTK then? Um, before I ask about your instruments, so what's next for BTK? What you got planned? So I think we've kind of spoke about a lot of it. So we've got the um, Galax tour. Um, we've got a number of festivals next year around Europe. Um, also, we're doing like Southwest Heavy Fest and some other stuff. Wash Against Cancer, we're doing um, in Coventry. Are you going which... to? Are you going to just if the next release is going to be an album? Do you think? Or do you think you're going to do them? Um. Release wise, I don't know yet. We haven't really sort of yeah. spoke about it. Like we've got it's to do this track for the tribute. It's a lockdown EP idea that kind of <laughs> got locked down. <laughs> um, 
Why wouldn't we in, in normal times just bosh out another album, isn't it? I think that's usually the way, isn't it? I think, and I think we will do that for mm. sure. Yeah, it's definitely on the horizon. Cool. See, for somebody, like, because I have albums as well, I haven't done it in a wee while, right enough, because uh, I'm now doing interviews, but see when you get an album, or see when you get an EP and it's like four songs, you're like, this is absolutely fantastic. Oh, that's it finished. Whereas with an album, you've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. You've got like a kind of story to it. So it's mm-hmm. yeah. easy to review. So if you've got four or five song EP, just record another two songs and actually you've got an album. You know, so. Well, so oh, the, the oh, stuff we were bit. recording, <laughs> yeah, the stuff we were recording, I think I had eight or nine tracks, but mm. they were quite different to what we've done before. They were um, much more sort of gore grindy, um, very were, short. I thought you were going to say glam metal there. I thought you were bringing your yeah, yeah, they were. influence in. Yeah, spandex. It was like, uh, yeah, um, yeah, still Panther, BTK. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. <laughs> well, uh, I've got the last question then. So, um, what instruments are you using? Like, uh, I don't know if you're using the same instruments live just now that you did with the recording of Lessons in Murder, or what's your instrument of choice just now? We'll start off with yourself, Paul. Go for it. Go so, you. I've normally I play um, a Monson Custom Shop, so that's the, like the blood splattered guitar that's a funky yeah. shape. Um, so they made that for me. Um, outside of that, I tend to play ESPs. Um, I, I, when I was looking at the questions you sent me last night, I was trying to think what I played on the album. Um, I think there was a BC Rich Warlock that I used to have um, that I gave, I got from a friend and I then gave it to his son um, recently. So I've used that. And I think the the the, war, the um, Monson and then I... We touched on Metallica earlier. I've got like a Kirk Hammett signature model because they're like my favorite band. I'm going to San Francisco in a few weeks to see them. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So I played all the leads on that. And then I just use Kempers for amps now. Um, what about pedals? I'm, I'm, uh, everything is just from the Kemper. Um, to be honest, I think it could probably power the, um, was the space station, European space station or whatever it is up in there space so it does everything i need it to and quite often it does more than i wanted to because i don't know how to use it properly um but yeah that's that that's me um, <laughs> pardon six or seven string guitar six i i can barely play six strings i tried seven and it's just yeah it's, it's too hard isn't it well i was i was just thinking like uh basement to watch our killings will probably just use the the two strings anyway will you not <laughs> Very just great. a one most of the time <laughs> and and then half the time i don't even bother with the frets i just hit it in rough time to the music so what do you tune it to um we're in c standard so i think that's a really cool tuning for death metal as soon as you go lower than that you're getting into b um and, and an even lower i think the, the high speed stuff it, it starts to disintegrate you don't it doesn't have the clarity yeah. um so c for me works really really well cool cool thank you very much paul Let you and sure. L- you're a, a multi-instrumentalist so uh... <laughs> um, no, i don't know about that that's a, that's a big term <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're just trophies behind you then um well oh, yeah. what people said so i'll give you that um so what what What's your setup then? What do you use for basement torture killings? The last two years, obviously being stuck at home, this has been the uh, the only real instrument available to me. So uh, playing, the, you know, the last tour and the last few gigs with both bands has been just like get to play a real drum kit again because there was almost a six month period at one point where I didn't actually play a real drum kit. It was just this, which has been evolving throughout the lockdown, adding new pieces every other day and there. Uh, trying to make it feel like a real drum kit, which is just a, a losing battle. But uh, on a more serious side, you know, stuff like this, little purchases that you buy, this is the new one, you haven't even seen it yet poorly. <laughs> um, you know, it's just a drums, you could, you know, spend your life buying new shit and it breaks every flipping week and then you buy a new one and it breaks a few months later, <laughs> as he will tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just a constant process. Uh, I play a very old drum kit uh, that I've had since I was about 16 years old and you put new skins on it and it still, still sounds sick, so why why bother? Um, one day I'll, I'll have a nice 
kit and it will never leave my house but <laughs> and that one will still come on tour there <laughs> i think that's about it really <laughs> To be honest with you, you're quite lucky because I've spoken to a good number of bands where the drummer just doesn't have access to anything. He's getting pots and pans from the kitchen or cardboard yeah. or something like that. You know? I was like that when I was a teenager, mate. Yeah, 100% like, yeah, hitting cushions and yeah. anything. Yeah. So, so what drumsticks are you using? Drumsticks? Uh, always big fun. These are somehow the ones that I only play on my electric kit. And... Um, Obviously, the, the gigging ones are packed away in a flight case downstairs. But, uh, um, it, yeah, literally, I've played the same Vic Fur sticks since I was probably about 15. Uh, I've used Axis pedals for the last 10 years. Um, recent things I've bought is, like, the foot plaster triggers, stuff like that. Um, always so hard to get endorsement. It's never going to work. It's just, you know, I, I like really expensive drums, so <laughs> it's just never going to happen. Let's, let's not lie about that, but yeah. <laughs> it's quite funny. You two are the artist that buys all the pedals and the geeks and all the rest of it, but it seems to be you are the one of the band. Uh, I definitely was. Now I'm like a, a it breaks and I replace it guy, as Paulie will tell you, it breaks. <laughs> um, Stop breaking it. Yeah, there's so many items if you're a drummer, though. You know, not losing them or breaking them every night while you get them all out of boxes and put them back and get drunk and try not to lose them. It's just pretty hard. <laughs> Isn't it? That's how we can tell a good gig. And it's like, how many things as you were not lost this time? It's like, it's always, where's the drum clutch in your pocket? No, it's not. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's a lot of items. I'm slowly roping in the bass player to be the... Uh, the drum tech, he doesn't know it yet. He's not here to defend himself, so we'll That's go with that. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, but thanks very much for that, Ewan. But Millie, um, with you being the vocalist as well, have you went through range of microphones before you're satisfied with the sound of this particular microphone? Or are you just a vocalist where you're just giving me a microphone and a grow into it? Yeah, honestly, I just rock up. That's it. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, 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 yeah. I'll shout for anything you give me. But, um, <laughs> yeah, honestly, honestly, I, I, I probably give it a go, like trying through a different, different few. But it's just not something that I've had the opportunity to do before. Like if there was a bunch like laid in front of me, I think I'd have a good bash at that. But yeah, it's yeah, it's never been the case. Just you know, usual Aston fifty eight bash out. There you go. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. No, I just wondered. I just wondered. Um, but listen, guys, uh, where will we, it's a silly question, but where will we find BTK on social media then for those that are interested in looking for you? So we've got our Facebook, which is Facebook Basement Torch Killings, I think. Um, Google is a good place to find us. Um, we've got Bandcamp, um, YouTube. We've got BTK Murder TV, so YouTube. Um, and Instagram is BTK Snuff Grind. I believe so yeah just all the usual places but we're, we're you know i'm really dead on with all the um social media which is why i can reel off all the addresses and stuff straight away not so yeah google <laughs> good stuff good stuff have you ever thought like um we're always going to have an underground falling we're never going to make the mainstream with things like yeah, basement snuff recordings and stuff like that no <laughs> I think it's probably that. Although we made the Guardian, how cool was that? Twice, yeah. so that, that, that was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I have to ask a more serious question. Then, obviously, um, your name's BTK, and all the lessons and murder, and all your lyrics and things. How many people have you killed? No comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not going to check underneath your floorboards. I'm just worried about that. Um, right. Don't do that here. You'll end up in the downstairs neighbours. I live in a flat. <laughs> 20 of them. 20 floors. Yeah. <laughs> 15. Good stuff. Good stuff. It's, you've just gone on to prove that all the things that you do is just tongue in cheek. You're just horror fans. And you just write and play music that you like to write and play. And that's exactly what it is. And you've got a good following. You've got a loyal following. And you play across countries all over the world. So keep on doing what you're doing. Anytime you've got something new, um, send it to Marshall Times. We'll also play it on Marshall Radio. We have been playing BTK on the radio, yeah. on my show and stuff like that. So we definitely do play it. 
Um, so yeah, just keep sending it our way and we'll do a bit to promote to promote it because it is worth promoting. All right. Awesome. Thank Here you. Right. Really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yes, guys.